Well, the good news this morning is that there, there were no displays of racism by the England fans at the Hungary game at Wembley last night, but the FA has had to launch an investigation after the Hungary fans clashed with police during the match. Yeah, the trouble started when officers entered the away end to arrest a fan suspected of racially abusing a steward. Well, former England footballer John Barnes has shared his own experiences <clears throat> of racial abuse, both on and off the pitch, in his new book, The Uncomfortable Truth About Racism. Uh, and he joins us now from Liverpool. It's an absolutely terrific book, John. Um, I know it's taken you um, a good number of years to write it, and there are some uncomfortable truths in it. Tell us first um, what, you, what your view is currently on uh, the players taking the knee. Because, of course, it is a powerful symbol against racism, but it does also draw this negative reaction that must have a negative impact on the players when they hear it. Good morning. Good morning, both of you. Um, well, Wilfred Zaha doesn't take any. There are many black players who don't take any. That doesn't mean that you're not standing up um, for, for racial justice and racial equality, but people do it in different ways. The Hungarians were pointing at the show respect badge, and if you choose to take a knee, you take a knee. If you choose not to take a knee, you don't take a knee. Booing, booing doesn't do anything. Booing, in my opinion, is wrong. However, the conversation, as we're having now, is not about the reason we're taking the knee. It's about whether they should be taking a knee or not, and we've been discussing this for months and months, yeah. rather than looking to the tangible difference that can be made, rather than just talking about whether we should be taking a knee or not. Well, that's um, absolutely so, right. So, yes, if players feel like taking a knee, that's fine, but if they don't want to take a knee, but they still want to support the cause in different ways, that's also fine. But you've actually gone a bit further than that. You've, you've described taking of the knee as tokenism, uh, which is implicitly critical, isn't it? I mean, you, you mm -hmm. basically seem to think that it's, uh, it, it does more harm than good. Well, you remember when 25 years ago they started passing the red card down in the Champions League matches? 25 yes. years later, nothing has happened. Yes. And in, since we've been taking a knee for the last year, you still have kids in the inner cities who, who are, are stabbing each other. You still have an apathy towards the black community in terms of jobs and education. So what is taking a knee doing? Apart from starting the com not starting the conversation about what we should be doing, we're starting the conversation about whether it's right to take the knee or not. And this has been going on now for over a year. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about the tangible difference that can be made as to why we're taking a knee. We're just talking about, should we still be taking a knee or not? And that does nothing. You take on a lot of shibboleths in this book. It's a great read, by the way. Uh, speaking as, as a black football player, as, as a, a now a black writer, you take on a lot of shibboleths. For example, you say that the debate uh, that, that, that followed the Oprah Winfrey interview and the allegation against the royal family, that there, was, there were discussions about what, what colour skin, how dark the skin of, of the little forthcoming baby Archie would be, you, you say in the book that you don't think there, was, there should be any issue about that discussion taking place in the royal family. You think it's perfectly acceptable. First of all, Meghan Markle, I completely support Meghan Markle in what she's saying, in that she, she has received um, unfair, racist abuse from the British media. That is what she's saying. I didn't see her criticising the royal family. I saw her criticising the media. It has been framed that she's criticising the royal family and who is the racist in the royal family. That The statement they actually made was her, as far as I'm concerned, talking about the British, the, the British monarchy and their... And their concern as to how the British public would see the baby if the baby was dark. I didn't read it as she's saying that they would be upset if the baby was darker. And what is the reality of that? Do we really believe that the British public, if they had a dark baby, would be an ac as accepting as if they had a white baby with blonde hair and blue eyes? And but we know what the answer is. So as much as we want to pretend that it wouldn't be an issue, it really is an issue with the British public because this is how we've been conditioned to think and this is what the book is about. The book is about how we, can all, we are all conditioned to think negatively from a gender point of view towards women, from a racial point of view, from a political point of view, and we've been conditioned to think in terms of hierarchy and racial hierarchy within all of us, not just the Hungarian fans last night or, or scapegoats who get caught. We have to look at ourselves and say, do we really believe in equality? And the answer is we don't. But don't come down too hard on yourself because this is how we have been conditioned to think and we have to challenge the environment that makes us think this way. So, John, when you heard that part of the interview, are you saying that the, the way you interpreted it was that that member of the royal family was actually concerned about how the British public would react to their baby? Well, that's how I interpreted it in terms yeah. of what she actually said. And, of course, they didn't tell her that. They said they told Harry and then Harry re related to her. Mm. So that is how I, that is how I, inter I, I interpreted it. So um, I, I 
understand, and I'm sure that a lot of black people would have thought that that conversation would be had. I'm, I'm hearing people on Twitter saying, well, that's unacceptable. How can they say that? What we're doing in this country is we're just learn teaching people how not to get caught in terms of the language you actually use. And then the people who get caught, we come down hard on them and say they're so different to everybody else. We all have biases. Racially, from a gender perspective, from a sexuality perspective. And we believe because we wouldn't throw a banana on the field or we wouldn't sexually abuse a woman, therefore we're not sexist or racist or homophobic in any way. 99% of us, the vast majority of us are to a certain degree. But we have a very binary position that because I'm a good person, I wouldn't throw a banana on the field, I therefore aren't racially biased. And we have to stop taking that stance as to, you know, it's, it's, it's a binary choice, either you are or you aren't. We all discriminate. And until we accept it within ourselves, then we can't change it. You're very interesting about the use of, of, of language in terms of race. And you say at one point in the book that, that you believe that there's been a neutering of, of TV broadcasters' language, that TV broadcasters and radio broadcasters are now very nervous and, uh, and over-concerned about what they might say in case they are accused of racism. Can you, can you go into that in a bit more detail? What do you mean about the neutering of, uh, of language? Well, we've seen it in, in, in football matches, and I've spoken to lots of the commentators and friends of mine who work in the industry, and they say that you can't call a black player lazy. Now, if a black player doesn't run back and he doesn't try and he stands there scratching his nose and he lets somebody run past him, you can call him lazy. Yeah. But unfortunately, because of the, whole, the old stereotype of the lazy black man, um, now you're not allowed to say that. Now, if you, want to be, if you want equality, if we want equality, we have to be treated equally. And if there's a lazy white person, there's a lazy black person. And I completely understand the, the essence of the lazy black man and the slave and, and going back historically, because mm -hmm. this is what the book actually talks about, colonialism and slavery and the legacy of that. But in, today, in, in, in today's age, if a black player is lazy or if a black player is powerful, if a black player is powerful, you look at the Dharma Traore, he is powerful, and there's nothing wrong with saying he's powerful. <laughs> If he runs past you and he pushes you out of the way with a lot of power, boxers. If you're going to... Mike Tyson is powerful. Yes. yes, you can also add intelligence if you want to add to that, but if there's no need to add intelligence to it, why do you feel you have to to then overcompensate for the fact that he's a powerful black man? There's nothing wrong with being it all a powerful come, black It man. all comes down to language, doesn't it? Uh, you, you also say that... Uh, moving away from broadcasting, you say that, that when a white person says to you in a very well-meaning way, uh, John, I, I don't see you as black... You think, no, 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 you're getting it wrong. Can, can you explain why that, that is not a helpful thing to say to someone like you? Well, first of all, I am black. I am black. <laughs> now, when they say they don't see me as black, because they feel there's a negative perception attached to black, that they feel they may be insulting me, why can't they see me as black and see me as, an, as, as normal or see me as equal or even see me as superior? Because they feel that they're actually elevating me out of the negative space where black is by saying, I don't see you as black. Mm. Now, that is what the book is all about, elevating... Not, not, the book is about not elevating special black people out of that negative space where society sees blackness and saying we like Obama and Jay-Z and, and, and Rio Ferdinand and elevating them out of that space. Let us think about and dismantle and talk and, and elevate blackness out of that negative space. Well, I wonder if when somebody says so that to, to someone like you... Black person ...and, and elevate him out of that space rather than just brilliant black people. But I wonder if, if when somebody says that to someone like you, I don't see you as black, what, what they're clumsily trying to say is, um, I'm, I'm colour-blind um, and I don't judge you either way because of the colour of your skin. But why, why, why does my skin play um, have a, a, it's a defining um, characteristic as to whatever innate qualities I may have? Exactly. So why can't they say, yes, I see you as black, but because I see it. If, I, if you see, and I've, been up to, when I've lived in Scotland, and of course, you, you go to an, an Indian restaurant and you have an Indian waiter and you expect him not to have a broad Scottish accent. When he does, you see an Indian man with a Scottish accent. You don't say, I don't see him as Indian, um, and I just see a Scottish person. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. It is the perception you have of him being Indian or me being black or a woman being a woman in a Fortune 500 company. And, and that is what we have to, to, to accept yes. and, and understand within ourselves. Yeah. John, it's fascinating talking to you, and it is a terrific book. I just want to go back to the beginning, because we were just discussing the taking of the knee, the reaction to it, your frustration that the uh, conversation focuses on that. What do you think should change in the structure of football and in um, the positions that people have in football that would actually mean that the reaction to Black Lives Matter, the murder of George Floyd, the taking of the knee, this movement had actually achieved something? Well, first of all, throughout history, elevating 
um, disenfranchised groups of people, be they black, women, gay people, into positions of power within the system as it stands now isn't going to change a thing, and that's not happened in the last 500 years. Mm -hmm. So putting black people... We had Obama as president of America. Nothing changed for black people. We had Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher before her. Nothing has changed for women. So if we believe that by elevating black people, women, gay people into these positions within the system as it stands, which is designed fundamentally to then favour a certain group of people, mainly white middle-class men, um, we're mistaken. So therefore, we can put all the black people we want. Christina Dick is now a woman in a position of power. She can't change a male attitude towards women because she's a woman in that position of power. So we believe that that is a solution. My solution is the opposite. Work from the bottom up. We've been trying to work from the top down for hundreds of years, and it has not worked. What we have to do is to change our perception of the average black person, the average woman, the average gay person. Then we will see many more average black people, gay people and women getting into these positions. You can't elevate those brilliant people out of those negative spaces that society sees them and thinks that's, that's going to work for the majority or that's going to change attitudes towards the majority. So if people believe that by putting more black people into positions of power, as we did with the Commission for Racial Disparities with Dr. Tony Sewell, who then said that there's no um, systemic racism, uh, that's a bit of a, a backward step for us, isn't it? Because we wanted a black man in those positions to tell them what is right. So when he says what we don't want to hear, do we then say, hang on a second, um, he's wrong. That's what we wanted. So the solution is not to get black people or women or gay people into those positions. <laughs> it's to change our perception of the average black person, the average woman, the average gay person, and other disenfranchised groups. You're such, a you're, such a clear, you're such a clear thinker, John, and it's refreshing, um, as is the book. It's such a good read, The Uncomfortable Truth About Racism. And it, as you say, Susanna, it's the product of, of quite a few years of deep thought, mm -hmm. and it's here on the pages, and it's well worth reading. Thank you very much indeed for joining us live. Good luck with the book.